This morning we're going to read through most of the Christmas story. We're going to start here in Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 12. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. I'll read something else for you. This is not from the Bible, but I think you'll recognize these words. "'Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house." Sound familiar? Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama, in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled down for a long winter's nap. <laughs> Those are peaceful sounding words, aren't they? The stillness, the peace of Christmas. You know they don't last, right? That peace, the very next line, it all falls apart. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. I like the idea of peace at Christmas. Some of you aren't at peace because you haven't found that perfect Christmas gift quite yet. Husbands, if you don't have it yet, perhaps get your wife a new kerchief. I don't actually know what a kerchief is, but it's just in the poem. That sounds nice to me, that stillness, that peace, that, uh, that uh, quietness of Christmas Eve. All those things sound so good to me. I long for those things. I, I like the idea of all those things. Christmas seems to offer us and promise us peace. We expect some type of peace at Christmas. We see it in the nativity. I mean, look at this scene for a moment. Jesus and Mary and Joseph, there's a peace, a stillness to that, isn't there? How many of you have a nativity at home? Yeah, we like these, don't we? We look and we say, this looks nice. This seems so peaceful, so still, so calm. And we'll sing a song like Away in a Manger or Silent Night and say, ah, oh, it just sounds so perfect and great. But there's more going on in that scene. Jesus, Mary, Joseph. It's not actually, as you dig into their stories, all that peaceful. At least not yet. And so this morning we're going to talk about each of those three characters, Jesus, Mary, Joseph. We're going to talk a bit about what each of them were going through or what they were up to at that point in time. Let's start with uh, Jesus first. Listen to the words that the angel announced to the shepherds. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Are those words of comfort? They sound peaceful at first to me. And then I start to think about it and say, with whom is God pleased? That's what it says, right? Peace among those with whom he is pleased. Is God pleased with us? Was God pleased with the people 2,000 years ago? The Bible actually tells us that he was not pleased. The Bible tells us that we were enemies of God. We were in conflict with God, that he was not pleased, and we should only deserve from God wrath, uh, judgment, uh, and all things bad because he was not pleased with his people. We weren't faithful to him. We didn't honor him. We didn't put him above all other things. Instead, we were breaking commandments all the time, and it wasn't just them 2,000 years ago. It's us today, too, that we often disobey God, or we make light of our sins, or we think, oh, it's not such a big deal, when it is a big deal. God is a perfect God and requires perfection from his children as well. Romans 5 says that we were enemies of God and that we didn't have peace, which is why Jesus came. When you picture Jesus, when you think of him at Christmas, this is how we often see him. He often looks pretty big for a newborn and pretty poised in his manger, and often he looks far too Caucasian and blue-eyed uh, for a little boy born in Bethlehem. But that's where, how we see him most often. Often he has crazy hair. Uh, but anyway, uh, like this is a lot of hair for a newborn. If this is night one, he's a hairy little guy. Jesus came to bring peace, right? Jesus comes. The reason he is in the manger is to bring a peace to us, but there isn't peace yet. While he's in the manger, there still is not peace. He's come to win that peace, 
And so we see that unfold through his life as he forgives sins, but we see it most clearly when he gets to the cross and dies there for us. That's when the mission of God, that's when the peace of God is finally paid for. It starts here, but it ends up on that cross. And then, then we have a hope and a prayer for peace. I don't know when you feel at peace, but my family's pretty young, and I feel most at peace when they are all asleep. I do. I think, ah, finally that's done. And then then they've left all their junk all over the house, and so we do like a cleanup, which takes way longer than it should. We do the dishes, we wipe off the counters and the tables, and the clothes are not only washed and in the hamper, but they've been folded and put away. That doesn't bother me as much as Miranda, but there's no peace until everything's in the right spot. And then we collapse on the couch and go, ah. Any of you guys do that? The final sigh of relief and peace. Jesus comes to win peace for us, and that starts here in the manger. But it isn't until he gets to the cross when he finally says these words, it is finished. Everything he had come to do was finished. There was nothing left for me to do, nothing left for him to do, nothing left for us to accomplish as a group together. It's all been done and satisfied by Jesus. And so the words from John's gospel say this, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I don't know what exactly that might have sounded like, but I think it sounded like this. (sighs) Ah. A sigh of relief and peace as it's finally all done. Everything he'd come for and the peace he'd come to win for us has finally been accomplished. In Micah 5, there's a familiar Christmas reading, and I want to read part of it for you and then read a bit beyond where we normally do. It says this, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. That's where we normally stop, but it keeps going. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. So it's talking after she's been born, then he's going to gather all of his people together, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth and he shall be their peace. Aren't those great words? As you think about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, as you think about him coming to bring peace, that he's going to come and he's going to gather all of his people together. And just like a shepherd would gather his sheep who are so nervous and anxious and frightened by all sorts of things, finally he will stand in their presence and we will have peace. What about you? Are you at peace with God? Sometimes we're not. Sometimes Christians, we are not at peace with God because something has happened and we're struggling to process it. God, why did this have to happen? Or why now? Or why that person? Or why me? Or God, what are you doing? Or God, are you listening at all? Sometimes we are not at peace with God. We're wrestling. We're in conflict. We're in turmoil with God. When that happens... You can picture Jesus in the manger and say, oh yeah, God loves me. Or you can look at Jesus on the cross and say, oh yeah, God loves me so much that even if I don't totally get it right now, even if I don't understand the why or the why now or why me, I do know that he loves me enough to live and die and rise again all for me. When you do not have peace with God, My hope and prayer is that you look to Jesus and that he would be your peace. Jesus allows us to have peace within ourselves. Let's talk a bit about Mary. We are told a lot about Mary, a lot of specific details about her. We assume that she was quite young because women were married at a young age. We know that she's from the town of Nazareth. We know that she's betrothed to uh, Joseph, which was a legal thing. It was uh, kind of the first stage of marriage, but much more significant than our engagements today says this as she has this uh, conversation with Gabriel. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. 
But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and she shall call it, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? I think generally when we think about Mary, we think of a great peace. I mean, if you look at her in the nativity, she looks so calm. She's just delivered a baby, but everything is good with Mary. She's out in the barn, but everything is just A-OK. Mary has this great peace. But as we go through this reading, here's some of the words that stand out to me. Greatly troubled tried to discern what this might be. And the angel's words, do not be afraid, or how will this be? I think Mary was wrestling within herself. I think there was some conflict within Mary. First of all, she's afraid as angels before. What is going on? What do you mean I'm going to have a baby? I don't really get this. I'm a virgin. I think there was some conflict inside of Mary. And conflict inside of ourselves doesn't mean there's a lack of faith. It just means we're struggling with something, and that can be okay. I think Mary was wrestling with this. All sorts of questions that must have been running through her mind. But I don't think Mary was at peace, not at first. What about you? Are you at peace within yourself? I wrestle at times to be at peace. I will go to bed and lay down beside Miranda in her kerchief. And as my head hits the pillow, I'll start to question things like, did I lock the basement door? I don't remember if I locked the basement door or not. So then I'll go lock the basement door and I'll sit well, I better go to the bathroom since I'm up. And then I better check my phone. When's my first appointment tomorrow morning? What do I have going on tomorrow? And then I'll end up checking things online for know, half an hour, flipping through Facebook. And there's no, still nothing there. I can let you know. Still nothing to see. And then I'll lay back down again and be there. And I think, oh, maybe I should get up and go pee one more time. I don't want to wet the bed tonight. And ruin Miranda's new, new kerchief. And... Um, you know, and then I'll start thinking through my sermon. Am I ready for my sermon? This will happen already tonight. I'll be thinking about Christmas Eve or about next week's sermon. Am I ready for a sermon? And then I'll start talking through my sermon. My sermons are almost half an hour long, so half an hour later, then I think again to myself, did I lock the basement door? There's this inner turmoil that I go through. Or if you really want to see me in turmoil, take me for lunch, somewhere with a big menu. And then I will just go through all kinds of inner conflict and worry. What should I get? I always ask the server, what do you think I should get? As if this stranger has any idea what I might like to eat. And then I'll ask Miranda, well, what are you going to get to eat? And then they'll come back and say, are you ready? And Miranda will say, yes, but I'm not. And she'll say, you will be ready when they get to you. And then in the panic, my eyes will fall upon something spicy, chipotle or five uh, dragon peppers or whatever it is. Is, and I'll say, yes, this is what I'll have. And as the server leaves, I'll remember, I can't eat spicy food. And so then I'll be in turmoil and I think, well, should I try and flag them down? Should I change my order? Should I have gotten just bread? Is that, would, would that have satisfied me? I am a person who struggles with these types of things. Maybe you go through some inner turmoils too, and maybe they're a lot bigger than what you should eat for lunch or if you've locked the door. Sometimes we struggle with turmoil, with conflict inside of ourselves. And maybe that's because of a mental health issue, or maybe it's just because that's how we are wired and we just always second guess. We do a lot of should ofs and would ofs and could ofs. Oh, why did I make that decision? Or why did I say that? Or how come I didn't do this instead of that? Sometimes we have conflict or turmoil inside of ourselves for a reason, like uh, Mrs. McAllister. Remember the McAllisters in the Home Alone movie? They are going to France for a Christmas vacation. How they ever afforded that, I have no idea, but that's what they're doing. Their alarm clocks don't go off in the morning because the power's been out. So they're outside where the shuttle's arrived and none of them are ready. And Mrs. McAllister is counting. Do we have all the suitcases? Do we have all the passports? Do we have all the boarding passes? Yes, yes, yes. So they hop in the shuttle. They're at the airport. She's still wondering. Something doesn't seem right. They're on the plane now halfway to France. She's still wondering, did we do this? Do we have that? Did we leave the stove on? Did we leave the garage door open? Yeah, we did leave the garage door open. No, that's still not it. And then she remembers, Kevin! And Kevin, their youngest son, is home alone. And there's a reason for that inner turmoil. But sometimes, there isn't. 
I was walking this week with um, a senior lady in this congregation, and as we were walking, she said to me, Pastor, I have a question. And I knew exactly what she was going to ask me, because she's asked me many times before, how do I know if I'm saved? Sometimes we have inner conflict and turmoil about things where we should have total peace. Sometimes we need to turn back to God's Word and be reminded, oh yeah, God said it, God promised it, God did it, so I don't have to keep worrying about that anymore. I know that God's got me. I know that God loves me. I know that I can have peace in this. The Bible tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is peace. The more time we spend with the Spirit, the more time we spend in God's Word, the more peace we'll see in our lives. I like how the conversation with Mary and Gabriel ends. It says this, And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. God, if you've said it, then I can trust it and be at peace with it. Jesus in John 14 said this, Peace I live with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Peace is a gift from God that his son has won for you. And so when all those questions, when all those doubts come up, you can say to yourself, peace. And then you can just pray and talk to God about it. (laughs) What about my parenting? Are my kids going to be okay? Peace. And just talk to God about it. What about this thing going on at work or in my marriage or my schooling or whatever it might be? Peace. You can just talk to God about it and trust that he's taking care of you. (laughs) We've talked about Jesus and we've talked about Mary. What about Joseph? In Joseph, we get a glimpse of what it's like not being at peace with others. I want to read this part for you. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she'd given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Here we're told a couple of things about Joseph. Uh, One thing we're told is that he was a just man, a righteous man trying to follow God's calling on his life. Another thing we're told is that he was a merciful man. We're also told that he was a pretty regular man. And so Mary comes to him. We're not told how this all unfolds, but says, hey, Joseph, by the way, I'm pregnant, and, he's, and it's from God. Do you believe me? And he says in his mind, no. No, I don't, Mary. And so he goes off, and he has made up this plan that because he is just and righteous, he will divorce Mary. We also know that he is a merciful man because the consequence or the punishment for committing adultery even in a betrothal was death. We see that in the gospels as a group of men bring a woman caught in adultery before Jesus. Do you remember this scene? They have her surrounded and they have rocks in their hands ready to kill her. Joseph doesn't want that to happen. He loves Mary, he cares for Mary, and he wants to divorce her quietly, secretly, as privately as possible, so that they can both go on with their lives. I can't imagine what Joseph would have been going through. I imagine he must have been hurt, angry, embarrassed. Uh, Maybe he felt some kind of shame on himself or on his family. How could this have happened to us? He feels that conflict with Mary and with God and maybe within himself as well. And then after God speaks to him, Joseph has a change of heart and mind. It says this, when he woke, he did as the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not, until she'd given birth to a son. I don't know what that year of marriage would have been like, that first year or those nine months. I don't know what it would have looked like as Mary became more and more visibly pregnant and people around them talked more and more. I don't know how many awkward conversations Joseph had. Because the story is that an angel appeared to Mary and to Joseph. We don't hear about an angel appearing to her parents or his parents. 
one of the, the gossip in town or anyone else. So who explained it all to them? I would guess it was Mary and Joseph and that it would have caused a lot of conflict and a lack of peace in their relationships. What about you? Are you at conflict with anyone around you? Maybe you're going to be getting together with someone for Christmas dinner or Christmas day and there's a conflict there even though they're a friend, even though they're a family. Maybe this was the year you said, do we really have to invite? But you did. In Romans 12, it says this, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I like all of the words in this sentence. They are so good. If it is possible, if there's any chance at all, if there's any hope at all, if it's in the realm of possibility at all, I like the next part, as far as it depends on you. Yeah, but they, or they're going to do this, or they said that, that's out of your control. As much as it depends on you, if it's possible at all, as much as it it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Yeah, but they... I don't live at peace with them. I don't want to. Isn't that often where it's really rooted? I don't want to. Yeah, but Jesus died for you to have that peace with him and within yourself and with those people. In Colossians, it says this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. I think the real crutch of the whole situation we have in most conflicts is this, the peace of Christ doesn't rule in our heart. When I am at conflict in myself or with someone else, normally something else is ruling in my heart. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's jealousy. Maybe it's disappointment. Maybe it's frustration. But that thing is now ruling in my heart. Whenever I see that person, whenever I think about them, whenever they speak, I'm just annoyed and angry and upset and judging them. And the peace of Christ has lost its seat in the throne of my heart where it belonged all along. In the Beatitudes, Jesus said this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. That word, peacemaker, reminds me that peace takes work. That it's not always easy. That Jesus came to win peace for us, and it took work. And that sometimes in your relationships, that peace will take work as well. But as you do it, you are doing the slow and faithful work of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Why? Because they're doing what their father would have them do. If you're out there working for peace, then you are doing the work of your father in heaven. World peace would be great, but peace in your own house is also pretty sweet. Church, when you see the nativity, I hope that it does bring peace to you. I hope that it brings you peace as you think about the peace one for you, not some idyllic scene, but a picture of God and his great love and sacrifice for you as he comes to win peace, a peace that starts in the manger but leads us to the cross and to the empty tomb. This Christmas, may you have peace. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today, and I thank you for your words that are recorded to us, and I thank you that they convey so much, that there's so much meaning and so much story written in here, and that it tells about regular people facing lots of regular things, questions and worries and fears and doubts and conflicts, and that written into each of those sentences, each of those stories is the larger story of a God who loves us so much that he came to bring us peace. God, I pray for each person here that they would have peace with you if they need to reconcile, if they need to confess something to you. I pray that they would do that and that they would be overwhelmed with peace, a peace straight from heaven to them. God, I pray for each person here, if they wrestle with doubts or questions or mental illness, if they wrestle with something where they're uh, always anxious or worried or fearful, I pray that you would replace that with the incredible gift of peace, that they would spend more and more time with you and see the fruit of the spirit of peace growing more and more in them. I pray that you grant them comfort and rest and peace. And God, for all those relationships where there is a conflict, where we just tolerate someone, or where we can barely stand to be in their presence, God, I pray that you would bring peace and reconciliation there, and that you'd put in our our hearts uh, to do the work of peacemaking. 
God, I pray for all those people who used to worship you and used to be in church and used to be reading their Bibles but have been hurt. Maybe they were hurt by a Christian or by a church or by a pastor or by a Sunday school teacher. I pray that they would have peace and they would be drawn back and that in you, Jesus, that they would find peace. God, for all the people who are gathered here, I ask that you would do something miraculous for them this Christmas and that they would hear this story with fresh ears and hearts and minds. That they would receive this story as one of great love, great grace, and great peace. And that it would continue to transform us and shape us. Lord, I pray for safety for all those who are traveling and that you would bless all the events that are happening and that all the trappings of Christmas, all the decorations and all the presents and the carols and the dinners and everything else would point us back to you and it would be an opportunity to start conversations about you. Lord, we pray that not only this church, but all of your churches would be full of people eager to hear about your son Jesus and your great love for us. For everything else in our hearts and minds today, God, we commit all those things to you, trusting in your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be...